Yeah, it's recording. All right, excellent. This is unusual. I've never actually seen this before. Okay, so I wanted to start out asking you guys um, how familiar you are with programming. I asked you guys. Uh, you guys know a lot of programming. Have you done programming in the past? All right. Have you ever done low-level programming like with C or maybe assembly? Assembly. Okay. Yeah, it was Boeing. Assembly. The what? Boeing. Oh uh, yeah. Was not fun. No, assembly is not very fun. Um, so Windows hooks. If I explain that real quick. Oh. So. Here's basically what a Windows hook is. It enables reading and modifying a remote process. What that means is when a game or... Oh, come on in. Okay, so you guys are here from the presentation? The Windows hook presentation? Yeah. Anyway, let's, let's keep it rolling. All right. So what that means is when you start up a game or um, Microsoft Word or Google Chrome, basically anything that runs as a process, we all know that. Uh, what it means to read and modify a remote process is basically in Windows, the way processes work is they open, modify, and close files. Um, but not files as they're typically understood, more really low level files, just zeros and ones. Um, they're stored at various locations in the system. And that's how a process essentially goes about reading, modifying, and displaying data in a human readable format. So the goal with Windows Hooks is to connect to the process itself through uh, various APIs that Windows provides for modifying these processes, uh, for reading them. And the way you do that is by reading messages that get sent. Um, uh, and when you're reading messages, it enables you to intercept either messages that the Windows process sends to the system or things from the system or the internet that's sent to the process. That's useful for, uh, here we have some use cases, either developing malware it allows you to peek at passwords before they're even encrypted by the system and sent over HTTPS or SSL or anything like that. Uh, it's also good for cheating at or enabling increased functionality in games. Uh, that's more useful for, like, let's say in Minecraft you want to run faster. Uh, it basically, you use various techniques to find your speed attribute and then increase it to whatever you want. Uh, learning and using tools makes this much simpler so that one, you don't need to have hardcore C programming or low-level programming with assembly and everything. Uh, you can use tools that have already been built. And when you're working with games or something a little simpler where you're just trying to look for solid numbers <coughs> like your run speed or how much health you have in a game, Cheat Engine is... Uh, perhaps the easiest way to get around the difficulty and complexity of Windows hooks. Um, could you guys hit the next button? I don't want to be reaching over you. Get out of that. There you go. All right, so DLL injections. This is one of the two techniques I'm familiar with for connecting to a running process. Uh, next one. All right, so DLL injection as opposed to injecting actual code into the running process. It's simpler and it has fewer restrictions regarding memory and references. Um, the downside is that it's more detectable by a running process. That means if a process that's running or a game that's running, especially with MMOs or uh, multiplayer games that have really strong anti-cheat uh, mitigation, they're going to detect simple DLL injections. Just because what you do with the DLL injection is register the actual DLL. Let's say you wrote the DLL yourself. 
it registers it with the process in an IET table, uh, and that allows you to tell the process to execute the DLL. Um, this works by attaching to the target process, or the, basically the game, uh, another from another process. So basically, you start your own process while uh, the game or whatever hasn't yet been started. And then from within that process, you start running the game. And you start running the game in uh, suspended mode or, or a way that you can easily inject a DLL into the process. Um, you can either inject the DLL or the path to the DLL, which is easier, but it's a little more uh, easily detected. Um, and then, of course, you start the execution of your DLL from within the target based on parameters like, uh, let's say your health gets down to 10, and you want it to shoot back up to 100 any time it gets below a certain value. That's when uh, you want your DLL to execute. And it could be as simple as increasing your health, or as complex as, let's say, in an MMORPG, you want your character to run around, and collect gold, go fishing, or you know, do whatever it is, and, and more RPGs, uh, as long as, of course, you can program that. And that's, that's I think, the real difficulty in uh, why maybe Cheat Engine or uh, Metasploit or... No. It, it enables that to be a lot simpler. Um, I do want to pause here, because I showed this to my roommate, and he got a little, uh, he got a little chipped up. And he's a pretty experienced programmer. Um, so I want to know, do you guys, at this point, sort of understand what what's going on here regarding windows hooks and how they be used or am i just totally yes uh so you have these hooks how do you actually tell which hook is from which variable sort of memory uh so um the actual hook itself is handled through a handle uh in the windows api the really low-level system API. Uh, the handle is what you use to connect to another process. It's not actually for an individual attribute or something. It's to actually connect to the process that allows you to register DLLs or inject code into the process or to run at certain points. Uh, so the hook itself is for the entire process. Um, and then either DLLs or outside code that, that's uh, all part of the same hook. Um, there are legitimate uses for this, such as in reverse engineering. Uh, it allows you to find values you might be looking for a lot easier. Uh, it helps smooth the reverse engineering process. And there are some other uses that maybe are a little too complex for a simple task, such as reading your email or gathering your passwords and storing them in a keychain type thing. Um, but again, there are much simpler ways to do that, and it's probably best that you use the simpler ways because, uh, again, this is really complex and takes a lot of development time just to get a hook working and get what you want out of the DLL injection. Um, and, and that's really the, the danger I'm running into with this presentation, is it took a lot for me to learn this, and I'm trying to break it down to a really simple level so you guys can understand, and if you're interested, go about figuring out how to actually program this stuff. Uh, next. Okay, so I, I wanted to use graphics, because I feel it's the best way to help someone learn something. So, like I said, you want to start your own process. Um, now, you can have the other process already running, and then you attach yourself to it. Um, that has some drawbacks, but the helpful thing is that it, the process can already be running and you just have to attach yourself to it. But for games and stuff, it's probably best if you start your own process and then from there execute uh, the target process, the game or the system or whatever, from within the context of process B. And that allows you to start it in whatever mode or, or way you want, such as with suspended. And that, that helps to avoid a lot of the mitigations that are thrown in for anti-cheat measures. Uh, with step two, you allocate memory within the actual process. Um, you said that you had assembly 
uh, level of programming experience. You're familiar with like how memory works and how you have to allocate it on the heap or the stack, and then from there you run, you store variables, you run code, right? That's what you're doing with DLL injections. You're actually allocating the memory within process A, and that allows you to clear up room for or create room for actual the actual DLL itself. Um, or a link to the DLL so that <clears throat> if you register the DLL with the process A, it will cause process A to then execute that DLL, execute your code, basically. Um, and you do that by creating a new thread within process A. And again, I feel like I might be getting a little bit in the weeds. You, you guys understand what's going on with here? some level. I, I, see, I see one guy shaking his head, so it's good enough for me. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, next. Okay, so this is breaking it down into what you, the, the actual programming steps you go about. Uh, within process B, you use open process. Um, and from there, you choose whether you're going to include the, just the DLL path, which is smaller, or the full DLL, which requires you to open up a lot more memory. It's a little slightly more uh, code, but not, not much. And then from there, you use virtual allocate EX to open up memory within the process. There are a lot of ways of doing that. Um, virtual allocate EX is not the only way. You can clear up memory uh, using various things, but uh, in the future, when I want to break it down into the coding level, I'm going to be using virtual alloc PX. Um, then with step three, when you're copying the DLL or determining the addresses, you use write process memory. Basically, using write process memory, you can take all the code from the DLL and put it into that space that you opened up within the process. Uh, with When you're just doing the DLL path, you use load library A. And when you're doing a full DLL, you use git memory offset. Uh, basically, the way that processes work is when, when they're allocating memory once they open, uh, the memory isn't static, meaning you can't just say, OK, every time I open a process, I know that I can go here to this specific memory address and inject my DLL. Uh, if you go about it in that static way, you're going to get undefined behavior. Uh, so you have to use you have to use uh, methods to find an actual location in memory, so that you can attach to it. And then when you go about executing, you can actually execute your DLL instead of doing you know some random thing because you don't know the actual memory address. All right, and then step four, when you go to execute, uh, there are a lot of ways of opening up a new thread. Uh, there are three. But uh, again, actually executing DLL, again, another path that ha or another way that has a lot of paths to go down, programmatically speaking. All right, next slide. All right, with load library A, this is the, this is the method that makes it really detectable. Um, if you're playing a game that doesn't care about detecting people cheating at the game or isn't very good about detecting people cheating at the game, you can use this. It's simpler but obviously more detectable. You use kernel32 DLL function. Uh, now do you guys know what I'm talking about when I say kernel32.dll? It, it's basically a systems dynamic library. It's something that gets installed automatically when you install Windows. Um, and there's a function within there that helps you to load other DLLs into a uh, into a process. So use kernel32 to take your DLL and put it into an existing process. Uh, same thing with executables and other libraries. And this is all done at runtime. That that means once the process is actually running, uh, that that helps you to load the DLL. Um, its only parameter is a file name. That means all you supply to load library A is the, the file name of the DLL, or the, or the path to the DLL. 
uh, and then memory is only allocated for the path to DLL. So it's a small amount of memory. Uh, yeah, it's simpler, but again, what is that? All right. Next. All right. This is another method. This is the one where you inject actual code into the process. So you're not creating your own library. You're not creating your own executable, injecting it, or you know, linking to the path to it. You're injecting real code directly into a running process. This obviously avoids the problems with writing DLLs and registering them with the target process, meaning it's less detectable by that process, or the game, or the MMO, if, you're, if you really want to go crazy with the uh, injections. This has more memory and DLL reference limitations. Basically, you're going to have a lot more difficulty managing memory this way. You're limited to about four kilobytes for your uh, for your variables and about 10 bytes is taken up by overhead so awesome uh, anyway oh there we go and then you start the codes execution with create remote thread so once you've injected the actual code into the process you use create remote thread to start that code running and obviously you're going to base that on my health is low or I want to speed up now or anything else you can think to do in the game. Next slide. Alright so I hate to cut it short. Uh, I did want to get really into the weeds and show you the programming and everything that goes into it but I, I really lost my audience with my roommate. He's pretty experienced at programming so I, I felt I should keep it at a high enough level and then provide an opportunity to get into the weeds if you're interested later on. Uh, the resources that I use are here. I'm recording it so you guys can go back and see these. And this is a really good site for once you once you are a little bit experienced at C, you can go read on the web archive because the actual site is down. Uh, a full series on writing a poker bot. Basically what this does is it reads what's going on in the poker program or whatever, and then we'll determine odds and bet for you, and it's basically just a way to autoplay poker. Uh, it's been used 